Hello, I'm Mike Molnar, and welcome to my presentation on early electrical meters. I think even a brief look at some of this early equipment will help you appreciate the work required to take the simple electrical measurements we take for granted today. This is a Lord Kelvin's electrostatic voltmeter. It was built by the Kelvin and James White Company of Glasgow and London and dates to the 1890s. Its operation is based on the principle that two conductors at different potentials attract one another. In this case, the first conductor consists of the two brass colored plates that are in a fixed position. The second conductor is silver colored and can rotate on a center shaft. It has an indicator attached at the top and it is kept in position by gravity and balanced with weights that are placed at the bottom of the conductor. When a potential is applied to the conductor, the movable conductor is drawn towards the fixed conductor and that draws strong enough to overcome gravity and the balance weights. As the indicator moves up the scale, a reading is then taken. That reading is multiplied by the number on the chart based on which of the weights is in place. We can see that a full scale reading of 60 and the highest multiplier of 200 would give a full scale reading of 12,000 volts on this meter. This device doesn't look like an electric meter at all. A tabletop unit it weighs in at 60 pounds. It is a Lord Kelvin electric balance built by James White in Glasgow and measures electrical current, also dated from the 1890s. Current is applied through the copper connections at the rear of the meter. The coils and discs are actually on opposite sides of a balanced beam. The heavy coils are wound such that on applying a current, the magnetic field pushes one disc up and pulls the other down. As the weight shifts, the operator can move weights along the front scale as you would on the old scale in a doctor's office. When balanced, the weights have a multiplier value times the number on the scale. This highest scale is around 60 amps. It certainly gives the illusion that you are weighing the electricity. And now we'll take a look at a simple voltmeter from the late 1800s made by K&D. It has a handwritten scale going up to 21 volts. It has a coil wound on a wooden frame with a pin set through it at the top. A small magnet is attached to the pin and the indicator is attached to the magnet. The magnet and indicator are balanced so that the position is at zero when no voltage is applied. To act as a voltmeter, the voltage is applied to a positive terminal and into the coil, then exits the coil and into a fixed resistance, then to the minus terminal. When a voltage is applied to the coil, it produces a magnetic field strong enough to overcome the force of gravity and deflects the magnet and indicator in a way that's proportional to the voltage that was applied. Next is a Thomson and Rice ammeter, which dates to around 1888. Ammeters can be recognized by their coils having heavier gauge wire and are wound with less turns. They in turn deflect an indicator in this meter across the top, which moves along that darkened scale. Thompson on the tag is inventor Ilyu Thompson from the Thompson and Houston Company that became part of General Electric. The name Rice is for E.W. Rice, an inventor who worked with Thompson and many others. At the bottom of the meter near the terminals, we can see an open switch, which to, is there to allow changes in the range of operation. This small DC voltmeter was made in Paris and has a scale of 1 to 12. The distance between dial marks tells us that the response of the meter is not linear and it gets its accuracy by the calibration of that dial at the factory. It's a small meter and is just about 4 inches in diameter.
This beautifully crafted meter comes with its own carrying case. It was manufactured by the James W. Queen Company of Philadelphia. From the second half of the 19th century, the company produced scientific equipment, astronomical equipment, and surveying equipment, all of a high quality. The dial, uniformly marked from 0 to 100, hints that the meter was not for 0 to 100 volts, but rather the operator would multiply the reading on the meter times some number on a calibration chart, a chart that was likely attached to the inside cover of the box. For example, a reading of 20 may have had a calibration factor of 5, so that the actual voltage reading would be 10 volts. The internal construction has a moving coil and two permanent magnets. From the side, we see that there is a removable section at the bottom. This section, when attached, extends the operating range of the meter. It puts 4,000 ohms in series with the meter itself, which is labeled to be at 1,975 ohms. This early meter is not marked with a manufacturer's name. That's unusual for something that was so well made. On the simple 0 to 5 volt scale, there is an unusual second piece on the dial. This brass colored arm can be positioned by turning the knob at the front. It could have been used to set a maximum reading or to steady the indicator or to lock down the indicator for transport. This meter was produced in London and is labeled Becker and Hatton Wall. I selected it because of an unusual feature in an early meter. This view shows a coiled spring providing the resistance that zeroes the meter, something usually found only on later meters. Also, there are two scales, one in red and one in black, and both are labeled from 0 to 10. This might imply two ranges for the meter that could be selected by a shorting pin going into the brass connections on the side. I don't have any documentation on this, but it could be that one pin meant reading voltage on one of the scales, and another pin in the other side could have meant reading current on, a, on the other colored scale. This unusual device is an Edison pressure indicator. It was used in power stations and is described in the book Dynamo Tender's Handbook, written in 1892. It was known that varying the dynamo outputs would shorten the life of the incandescent lamps of the power station's customers. This device could regulate the pressure, now called voltage, coming from the dynamos. It utilized a lamp in a Wheatstone bridge circuit and a galvanometer that would allow the operator to balance the voltages. This is a Westinghouse AC ammeter. Its components are mounted to a heavy rectangle of marble, and the components are also shielded from any air currents by the glass case. This meter likely dates from the late 1890s. Westinghouse had won the battle of the currents, and the number of AC installations was on the rise. When mounted on a wall, the plumb bob on the right side is used to assure the meter is level both left to right and front to back. At top center, a shaft holds the indicator arm and is the pivot point for an iron rod and a balance weight. The balance would be adjusted to zero the pointer. When current passes through the coil, the iron is drawn down, deflecting the indicator. Full scale on this meter is 60 amps AC. This meter was made by the Victor Electric Company in Chicago, no relation to the Victor Phonograph Company. This is an example of some meters made for or by companies working in electrotherapy and x-ray. Victor is one of these companies, started in 1893, and it became part of the Victor X-ray Company, a division of General Electric, in 1920. Another example is this Macintosh meter. Macintosh also a company that was building electrotherapy equipment. This is one of their devices. You can see a meter at the top uh, built for electrotherapy 
and it's called the poly sine, which had an output of various uh, formations of sine waves. This is an early ohm meter by the Waite and Bartlett Company, another electrotherapy and, and x-ray company. This Waite and Bartlett milliamp meter shows the company's New York address. From that location, they made many types of medical equipment. Their products included this large Holtz machine capable of producing tens of thousands of volts to perform electrotherapy treatments and to power early x-ray tubes. This early meter was produced by the Weston Company, started by Edward Weston. It marks the beginning of what we recognize as early 20th century meters. His goal was to make meters that were direct reading, meaning a dial reading would not require calibrations or calculations from a table. Striving for perfection, Weston included a mercury thermometer you can see on the upper right side and a dial to compensate for the matching the t room temperature to the um, meter. With further development, he produced the Model 1. It included improved shunts, a moving coil with a permanent magnet, and a coil spring with a jeweled movement. It can be confusing to study these meters, as all of these are Model 1s. The Model 1 was produced for decades. The buyer would specify what he needed the meter to measure. Weston also provided large power station style meters for companies all around the world. Weston still produced meters into the digital age. The top meter works with a small LED display and the bottom meter used Nixie tubes. That's the end, so thanks for watching this presentation. I don't promote myself as an expert on this equipment, so I would be interested in anyone's comments or further information. And I would like to get an email at mulnar at diagnostic-services-inc.com. Thanks again.